In this video, I'm going to be building an awesome gaming PC for high-end 1440p and entry-level 4K gaming. Inside of one of the most interesting looking PC cases I've seen this year, with yet another motherboard that moves all the cables and connectors to the back. Is this the future of sleek and simple gaming PC builds? Well, I'll be covering off this and all the other parts that make this build possible, how to assemble it from start to finish, and looking at performance a little bit later. Let's do this. The Corsair K65 Plus Wireless is a 75% mechanical gaming keyboard with hot swappable pre-lubed Corsair MLX red switches. You get two wireless connection modes with both Bluetooth and 2.4 GHz and up to 266 hours of battery life for non-stop gaming. Customizable RGB lighting, Corsair IQ support and a programmable rotary dial make this a compact keyboard that has it all. Perky RGB lighting, a sleek grey and silver design, two layers of sound dampening and screw-in stabilizers round off a keyboard with plenty of features. I'm going to start things off by giving you guys a quick rundown of all the parts I picked and why. The first of those is the CPU, Intel's Core i7-14700K. Now of all of the 14th gen chips, the 14700K and KF are my favourite. You get more cores over 13th gen, TDPs and temperatures are pretty high, but the cooler is beefy so we should be fine, and you get performance that is significantly better than most of AMD's Ryzen 7 options, not only for gaming, but for things like video editing and rendering too. The 7800X 3D comes close from a gaming point of view, but the 14700K takes the edge when it comes to gaming and everything else. Now talking of coolers, I have gone for Cooler Master's Atmos 360. This is one of the best performing CPU coolers on the market within that 360mm bracket. And you can see from our review in the card section now why we like this design so much. Cooler Master have taken their coolers up a notch with this. You can 3D print changeable top plates for the CPU water block. You get three of their high-end RGB 120mm fans included, and the fans come pre-screwed into the radiator, making installation and setup that bit easier. As far as graphics goes, I've gone for a 4070 Ti Super in this build. The GPU landscape has changed a lot recently. Obviously, new 7900 GRE, which competes with the RX 7800 XT and 4070 Super. And on the NVIDIA side, we have new Super variants of the 4070, 70 Ti, and 4080. Now, the 70 Ti Super is pretty well positioned. It doesn't have quite as much direct competition from AMD, though their 7900 XT with its latest price drop does come close. Personally, I like the advantage that DLSS3, frame gen, and ray tracing bring on the NVIDIA side of the equation. Simply put, AMD's comparative technologies are not as good. To be clear, AMD will offer you a bit more VRAM and better straight rasterization at this price point. And for some people, that will be enough to justify the AMD card over the NVIDIA. Neither is necessarily definitively better than the other, but it's great to see so much GPU competition within the market generally. As far as motherboard goes, sticking with a bit of an MSI theme, nice to have things coordinated, the Z790 Project Zero. Now Project Zero is basically like MSI's version of Asus BTF, they came out at the same time. We saw Gigabyte pilot this a long time ago but have not really bought anything out since. And this design actually feels really quite high end and quite fancy. If you've not seen these boards before, basically what they do is move all the fan headers, RGB headers, power connections to the rear of the motherboard. And what it means is that on the the front of the board, you actually have no visible cables or connections. This makes cable management look a lot better for a start, no power supply cables to worry about as these are hidden at the rear, and from an actual ease of building point of view, it means that when you need to access that finicky USB header at the bottom of the board or reseed a motherboard or CPU power cable, you've not going to try and cram your fingers through a gap that's a little bit too tight to get it to connect. I do like the look of good sleeved cable extensions and secretly I kind of miss them when I'm using stuff like this, but I do acknowledge that this is the future and I do think it's really clever. The only caveat is that you need a back to front or Project Zero compatible case for it to work. More on that in a moment. Otherwise though, Z790 gives us overclocking for our CPU and our memory, PCI Generation 5 for graphics and the SSD too, and you get loads of this really nice silver shrouding all around the board that looks premium and helps to keep that clean aesthetic in tow. IO is pretty solid as well. Obviously loads of our USB ports. We've got a 20 gig Type-C, 10 gig Type-A and a 2.5 
Ethernet with Wi-Fi 7. And if that wasn't enough, this board is obviously 14th gen out of the box, as a lot more boards are increasingly nowadays, meaning no need for a BIOS update on the board to use the 14700K in this system. Talking of cases, I wouldn't normally move on to the case at this point, but obviously it is directly linked to the motherboard choice. This is actually really, really interesting and got me quite excited when I first saw it. It's the MSI Maestro 700L PZ. Now, obviously with this being an MSI PZ case, it's guaranteed to work with our PZ motherboard in terms of where those cable cutouts are. However, Corsair recently released their two and a half and six and a half thousand DX series, which also supports some of these back to front boards. So you aren't stuck necessarily with an MSI case in order to use an MSI board. The reason this stands out to me though, is that I've never seen anything like it. Now on the face of it, it looks like a dual chamber case, nothing new there, but the glass is fully curved. And if I try and remove this panel, which from experience is a bit precarious and quite nerve wracking. Oh, hello. Look at this. What on earth? Oh my word. It's unbelievable. Now Montex King 95, which I love by the way, has a curved glass panel, but it's made up of two pieces. MSI have just gone, nah. <laughs> that, we're doing it properly. And it looks amazing. Like what? Uh, wow. It's just so cool. <laughs> It's future James here with a bit of an update on this case. Now you'll have heard me just compare it against the Montec King 95 Corsair 6500 without realizing quite how expensive this is. This is a staggering $419 MSRP. Now it is limited edition and it doesn't take away from the fact this case is really still pretty cool. But if you're building this build and you're trying to be quite price conscious, I don't want to lead you astray. Maybe look at something else. I'll link some alternatives below and just keep that in mind. A cool case, but definitely not cheap. As far as this goes though, inside it looks like a fairly standard dual chamber case. It's kind of a mix between a Lee and Leo 11, Montec King 95, but the interior reminds me a lot of something like a Height Y60. That's because natively by default, it's a vertical GPU mount. You get the PCI riser cable included, though it doesn't come pre-screwed in, not sure why that is, with some adjustability as well. Room here for up to three slot graphics cards. If they overhang past that, that's fine, but obviously you've only got enough room to screw in three PCI lanes. Would have been nice maybe to see a fourth, just for a bit of extra compatibility. Otherwise though, motherboard tray, it's all this kind of matte finish. It does scratch a little bit easily, I've found in places, so something to beware of. Room for some fans at the bottom, and then we've got, of course, a side fan and radiator mount, and room for more at the top too. The case feels incredibly premium, all very, very solid forged metal, which is pretty amazing, but it is heavy, and does feel a little bit tricky to work with at times, just because of how heavy and solid and sturdy a lot of these metal panels are. You'll also notice by nature, the slightly weird thing, is that the rear panel's very small, so there's really like not a lot to the rear panel, meaning we need to be really careful when we build this system that we don't scratch the case or scratch any of the components as we put it together. I realized I've missed out one or two parts that I didn't talk about. RAM, XPG Lancer DDR5 in black. Personally, really like the look of this kit. CR36, 6,000 megahertz speed. What more could you want? Storage wise, on the floor, because I take good care of my components, is the MP600GS for this build. A two terabyte Gen 4 NVMe drive from Corsair. Read and writes of 4.8, 4.5 gigs per second respectively. Not gonna set the world on fire, but certainly quick enough for a system like this. I realize I've kind of made a bit of a mess, so I'm gonna kick things off by putting the motherboard into the case first of all, only because installing things like the SSD, CPU now are so much harder because of course we've got those back to front cables. We can't exactly just plonk the motherboard down on a table and expect everything to go okay. The safest place for this board with all these delicate pins is in the case. Once the motherboard's in, as I say, that CPU installation is a lot easier, no risk of damaging any of those cables. Cables. CPU just pops in, of course, to our LGA socket, a little something like so. Pop the cover down, retention arm goes into place, and we are good to go. RAM or memories next. We're going to use the second and the fourth slots for the memory in this build. These click into place with no major issues and look pretty good. Next up is the SSD. Ah which is stuck in the box. That's gonna go into the top slot on this board. Any of the slots really are fine because this is a Gen 4, not a Gen 5 drive, so we haven't really got to worry about bandwidth too much. Obviously, the built-in heatsink or heat spreader is gonna help to keep that drive cool, which is good, and it leads to a more unified build aesthetic. It'd be nice to see this be a bit more toolless. MSI have got some really great toolless NVMe installations. Evidently, though, not on this board, but that's okay. We still have a toolless latch for actually securing the NVMe drive into place. That just flicks over nice and easily. With two 
screws to secure the heat shield down, not being too much of a hassle. Next up is the CPU cooler. I'm gonna be using this back plate that comes included in the box just to brace the cooler in, followed by these posts, which are also included with the CPU cooler. They have a female thread on one end, which will screw into the back plate and a male post on the top, which we'll be using to secure the water block down. Typically, I always try and do the CPU cooler prep as early as possible, as doing it later can make your life unnecessarily more difficult. The next step is the remainder of the CPU cooler. And as you can see, it comes packaged really nicely. You get all the installation hardware in different AMD and Intel boxes over here. The actual CPU water block itself, which looks really quite nice, including a thermal paste guide at the bottom. And the actual radiator and the fans come all pre-done in this nice little cardboard packaging. Not only is this a bit more eco-friendly than a plastic bag, which I like to see, it also protects the fins on the radiator from damage. Feels really premium. I'm just a massive, massive fan. Three 120 mil ARGBs here with nice braided cables for both the RGB and fan connections. Good to see. As far as positioning goes, I think I'm going to pop the radiator in an exhaust configuration on the top of the case. At least that's my sort of initial idea. I don't think we need to overcomplicate matters. We just need to make sure there's enough air flowing around the system to keep everything cool. Once the radiator has been screwed into the top of the case, it's then a simple task of securing the water block down with some of the included thermal paste. With that all sorted, I'm going to take the included vertical GPU riser cable and this is going to screw in nice and easily to the included vertical GPU mount. That is where I'll be mounting our 4070 Ti Super, which not only is going to look really good, but should also be beneficial for cooling. This case is really spacious, so plenty of room to play with. That is then going to allow me to pop the GPU in. Brand spanking new as well. We love to see. Oh, we've got a peel. Here we go. I'll be quiet. Nice. Now, this is only a two slot card. It's the slim version, meaning it sits just about within that two slot form factor. Tiny bit of overlap, but not too bad. You can see here as well, it's gonna look really nice in the case, matches the scheme of the build. Only criticism I would have is that MSI's GPUs aren't hidden cables. Aces have got an extra little PCB connection point that actually does the power, meaning no need for that Gen 5 connector. Not a huge deal, but in a build that's meant to be zero cables, it just kind of throw things off just a little bit. Now, in terms of PCI lanes, just a couple to remove from the rear and then a simple case of slotting the GPU in. Nice and easy, no dramas. And having this vertical GPU mount pre-configured is nice to see. They could definitely screw in the riser cable as standard though, like they do in the Y60 and the Y40 from height. And then all that remains is the power supply, which should obviously be easier in this build, but it's quite a big thing. Do the zero cables really, really actually genuinely make things easier? I guess now is the time we find out. Obviously sticks with the theme, MSI sent this and the other bits out at my request for this build. And I have to say, Genuinely, MSI are putting together some really cool stuff at the moment. It's just little innovations that others aren't thinking of, like a yellow PCI connector. This is obviously hidden when it's installed in the graphics card, but if any of the colors still poking through, you can see the cable isn't seated properly. Now, as far as the cables go, obviously this is a modular unit, so you only need to plug in the cables we actually need for this build. And once they're in the power supply, the back to front approach should make it really, really easy to plug the cables themselves into the connectors on the motherboard. For this build, you'll need a motherboard power cable, which is the largest one. You'll also need a CPU power cable or two CPU power cables to be precise, as well as our PCI Gen 5 cable too. I always like to add a SATA power cable in, even if I've not got any SATA drives, as lots of RGB accessories tend to use these, and having one in the build is nice to have. Don't chuck away any spare cables, as you may need them at a later date, and trying to find replacements is not always the easiest thing, talking from experience. Plugging in particular cables, especially the motherboard one, is really easy with this system, as you can see. The CPU is a bit harder as it's tucked up in the top right corner, but still arguably easy easier than if it was on the front of the motherboard. The GPU cable in this case is also a little bit easier to hide, which is good, but would love to see that reverse cable design applied to the GPU in some way too. All that then remains is to add some fans down the side and the bottom of this build and close it up to see just how good it looks with that uninterrupted tempered glass side panel. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below and I'll rejoin you in a few moments for some gaming benchmarks. into the benchmarks and it's time to see how this build performs. In order to test it out, I used MSI's new 4K 240Hz QD OLED, the 321 URX, which looked great and allowed me to benchmark at 4K and 1440p with ease. The first game I tested out was Call of Duty's Warzone. Why? Because everyone loves it. High settings, DLSS, quality at that 4K resolution yielded an impressive 128 FPS average. The game looked great, frame rates were pretty consistent and to do this at 4K, 
4K obviously shows you've got great legs at 1080p and 1440p too for even higher frame rates. Modern Warfare 3, 4K high once again, DLSS enabled and set to quality. Here pulled in 134 FPS on average. I tend to use DLSS only really on the quality preset in games like this. I find that it works better than AMD FSR, at least in terms of the impact on visual fidelity and allows us to get a bit of a boost to those frame rates. Starfield was more vanilla, 4K high settings, pretty run of the mill, no DLSS or ray tracing at play here. The game achieves 61 FPS on average at that 4K resolution. Now for an RPG game, this is totally fine. Starfield should definitely be better optimized and you're going to see similarly kind of disappointing results in the frame rate department on any card. Starfield just remains an incredibly difficult game to run. Hogwarts Legacy was slightly better at 4K high, but not going to set the world on fire. Here we got 70 FPS on average. Again, with it being an RPG game, it's less of a problem, but it would be nice to see a bit more frame rate upside and you might find find yourself dropping down to 1440p in games like Hogwarts more than others. Tuning that resolution right down for the next test, it is of course Fortnite at 1080p competitive. Here the build pulled in a amazing 308 FPS on average. You cannot complain at this frame rate. 90 and 99th percentile results were good too. Finally to wrap things up, also tested out Apex Legends at 4k high settings and the 4070 Ti Super delivered once again. 160 FPS on average gave competitive frame rates even at that top end 4k resolution. What do you guys think of the performance of this build and the system in general? I've got to say I think it looks great. The case admittedly far more expensive than I'd initially realised but a build that looks and performs the part. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Get subscribed to see more from me and as always we'll see you in the next one.